As a precocious young conservationist, I did what I could for the wildlife that was in trouble in my neighborhood. But at the same age, I discovered that there were many wondrous species that had gone extinct before I was born. I couldn't believe that previous generations had let those species slip away. Why had they not done more to save them? I promised that when, when my time came, I would have something to say and do about it. True to my youthful pledge, I became a conservation biologist and spent my career working to save endangered species, including many of these. Fortunately, all of the species that my students and I worked on are doing fine, thank you. And they're doing fine because conservation biologists have developed strategies for preventing species extinction. Right now, the future of species diversity basically rests on three strategies. We can protect species and their habitat from direct harm by human beings. For species that we utilize as natural resources, we can conserve them and make sure that we use them in a sustainable fashion. For species that have gotten in trouble or environments that have degraded, uh, we can restore them to viable and functional conditions. Now, we're about to add a fourth strategy. Revive, bringing species back. If you know anything about stools, you know that a three-legged stool balances quite easily. The length of the legs doesn't really matter that much. When you add the fourth leg, you have to be a lot more careful about balancing the legs. And conservation biologists are a bit concerned that de-extinction might indeed have a destabilizing effect on our efforts to protect, conserve, and restore extant biodiversity. If extinction isn't forever, a lot changes. In a big evolutionary context, 3.8 billion years of life on Earth comes undone. It's never happened before. Extinction has been forever for a long time. For 50,000 plus years, our species has been an agent of extinction, and we've been forced into a defensive posture where all we can do is slow, try to slow the rate of loss. De-extinction perhaps lets us to some extent go on the offensive. And certainly for conservation biology as an endeavor, one of the urgencies about conservation biology is the idea that there are no second chances, and the precautionary principle tells you that we better not let species go extinct because we're not going to bring them back. If we can, obviously, a lot changes, and we worry about unintended consequences. De-extinction might indeed undermine conservation biology efforts. We have a hard enough time convincing the public that preserving biological diversity is an endeavor that's worth making some sacrifices for. If the public views biodiversity conservation as less calamitous, um, it would make conservation biologists' job that much harder. Anyone who's worked on endangered species knows that those who are inconvenienced by the presence of an endangered species will very predictably seek any techno fix they can to make that obstacle get out of their way. Can't we move them somewhere else? Can't we take them into captivity? Can't we mitigate for the habitat we're destroying by recreating it somewhere else? And soon we may be adding to their arguments, can't we let them go extinct and bring them back later? It could legitimize the threats to biodiversity and indeed could give us an unfortunate out. The net problem of this could be a net loss of biodiversity. If we bring back a few special species, but at the same time make it easier for less charismatic species to slip away, we could actually end up with a net loss of biodiversity. De-extinction could also be a distraction. <coughs> a distraction I mean diverting resources from efforts to conserve biodiversity. It could happen, especially with species that have been extinct for a long time. Species that have been extinct for a long time have left behind a community that's moved on without them. 
new dynamic equilibria have been established and the reintroduction of a long extinct species into that community could in fact have essentially the same effect as an invasive species. Reviving long extinct species also face environmental conditions that are probably different than those at the time that they thrived. Certainly, we worry also that bringing back these species may result in what we call conservation dependency, where these species are always going to need additional intensive help to keep them um, going. And in all those cases, um, we worry that we could, in fact, make life more difficult for conservation uh, biologists. Indeed, we probably need to have uh, a way of predicting which species are going to be problems and which species might actually be good candidates for de-extinction. I think we actually need to invent a new sub-discipline that I will call resurrection ecology. And if we do, probably that new field will use something like triage to decide which species actually come back. There certainly will be species that can't or shouldn't be revived, and those species should remain extinct. There are probably species that might be revived, but we're worried that there might be some problems associated with their revival. Those species we should think very, very carefully before the saber-toothed cat is out of the bag, so to speak. But then there are the species that can and perhaps should be uh, revived. And for those species, we should probably proceed cautiously and thoughtfully uh, to see how things might proceed. Focusing on that last group, we already know that there are some conservation problems that the technologies of de-extinction can actually help with. For species that are severely endangered, they often pass through severe genetic bottlenecks when their populations are reduced to very small size. That means that even if we affect their recovery, they are often genetically depauperate. When I started working on the Mauritius kestrel almost 40 years ago, it was down to seven individuals. It's now up to several hundred, but those individuals are genetically handicapped, which means for any changes that take place in the environment, such as future climate change, they don't have the adaptability to cope with changes. The same is true to some extent of, of the black-footed ferret. These are species for which bringing back extinct alleles could, in fact, help them have a more secure future. De-extinction could also be a very useful conservation tool when we're dealing with extinct species for which we have solved the issue that caused them to go extinct. And fortunately, we have solved some problems. There are some threats to biodiversity that are no longer likely uh, to be as threatening as they were in the past. Perhaps the most obvious are the cases where we directly overkilled a species. And certainly for the thylacine, that was the case. It was ruthless predator eradication. One hopes we have moved beyond that by now, and that, as you heard earlier, the thylacine might indeed uh, find a receptive and hospitable environment again in Tasmania. Something like the ivory-billed woodpecker. Its habitat was decimated a little over a century ago. It has now regrown, and much of the bottomland forests that it lived in are protected as national wildlife refuges and, and other protected areas. The ivory-billed woodpecker would come back into an environment that is now much more welcoming to it. De-extinction could also be very useful as a conservation tool when we bring back recently extinct species that we know are coming back into places in which their future will be secure. And we have many examples of that, of places in the world that have now embraced conservation and now provide opportunities uh, for these species to once again flourish. In South Africa, they have lots of protected areas. They have a very sophisticated wildlife conservation program there. The quagga would probably find uh, the future that it needs. Similarly, marine mammals have become much a conservation priority. And a species like the Caribbean monk seal uh, might find the Caribbean a much more hospitable place. There are also the species <coughs> 
that have gone extinct and left behind ecological partners that suffered in the absence of the extinct species. While working on the island of Mauritius, I discovered a relationship between the tombalacock tree and the dodo. The tombalacock tree was declining toward extinction because it needed the dodo to improve the germination rate of its seeds. And indeed, there are many organisms that could benefit by bringing back ecological partners, whether those are pollinators, whether they're seed dispersers, whether they're keystone species that have disproportionate impacts on their ecosystem. We've seen what the uh, revival or the reintroduction of a locally extinct top predator can do in the case of wolves in the Yellowstone. There are many other ecosystems that could benefit and in fact enhance the, the future for many of the species living there by having an extinct species uh, back. Well, indeed, if it works out in the lab and they can actually turn that genome into an organism, conservation biologists are pretty good at taking a small number of individuals and turning them into a viable population. We've done it. We've brought species back from very nearly the brink of extinction. We're quite good and sophisticated at captive breeding and reintroduction. So if that is necessary, uh, we think we have the tools that would probably allow us to succeed. We're also getting better and better at restoring ecosystems via reducing missing keystone species or co-evolved species. And indeed, if we focus our attention, as I think we should, on recently extinct species, conservation biologists may even have had some experience with the species before it went extinct. All of this means that after the lab work is done, what comes next, although it's challenging, is something that conservation biologists have done before. We're not going quite into the untrodden ground um, of, of the biotechnology. So in the end, is de-extinction a contribution to our efforts to preserve biodiversity, or could it possibly be a distraction? Well, I think unquestionably, conservation biology's priority must remain ensuring a future for over 10 million species that are already existing on the planet, a growing number of which are threatened with extinction. De-extinction in light of that extinction crisis sort of becomes a very exciting but dramatic side story. It pales in comparison to the challenge that we face of just holding on to the species that we have, let alone bringing back extinct species. And finally, if it does happen, if we do revive a species, conservation biologists should be playing a role. Their role probably comes early in the process, helping identify the species that should be prioritized for revival. And after the lab work is done, bringing those species back into uh, their natural habitat. I, for one, am excited about the prospects of engaging in a deliberative process that might one day bring back some of those species that I lamented as a boy. In the meantime, our hands are full, preventing extinction. Thanks. <laughs>